Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the video companion series for the African Methodist Episcopal Church, A History, written by Dr. Dennis C. Dickerson, Sr. The focus for today will be Chapter 2, The Freedom Church, 1831 to 1861. My name is Dennis C. Dickerson, Jr., a member of St. James AME Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Section 1, entitled Reconciling Institution Building and Insurgency, centers around how the denomination, while constructing the necessary structures and operations to sustain itself, experienced tensions between these legitimate institutional activities and espousing its emancipationist ethos. The focus shifts to Richard Allen's family life. Allen would marry his second wife, Sarah Bass. The couple had six children. It is unclear whether Bass was ever a slave. She was hired as a nurse by Allen and Absalom Jones during the yellow fever epidemic. She aided fugitive slaves, sheltered runaway slaves, and worked with the Underground Railroad. Bass's example of social holiness embodied an emancipationist temperament that proved her to be more than just a supportive wife. Not only was Jarena Lee a powerful preacher, but she was also an abolitionist who was often present at anti-slavery events. She even spoke in 1853 at the National Meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Lee was also opposed to colonization. Morris Brown officially organized the Canada Annual Conference in 1840, the first conference outside the United States. The conference consisted of slave escapees and expatriates from Philadelphia, Cincinnati, and other places where racial violence threatened their physical well-being. AME churches became places where abolitionists hid fugitive slaves and where free blacks constructed their own communities. Church growth required Morris Brown to tend to denominational governance and other institutional duties, which at times deflected his focus from the frontline fight for black freedom. AME leaders were wrongly accused of being focused on their own insular interests more than with major matters confronting the black population. In 1840, at the New York Annual Conference, Charles B. Ray, editor of The Colored American, compared the AME Church unfavorably to the AME Zion Church in size and involvement in black causes. AMEs objected, and Morris Brown sent a delegation to speak to Ray. In spite of whatever critique, AME membership grew more than its counterparts. This slide illustrates how AME membership compared with that of the AME Zion Church and with the Union Church of Africans. Frederick Douglass, while a slave, attended Baltimore's Bethel AME Church. Douglass grew disenchanted with the church because some officers showed hostility toward the abolitionist movement. In 1835, five trustees criticized anti-slavery publications as vile and incendiary. The Bethelites may have feared for their safety and continued existence of their church in a slave state. Nevertheless, Douglas found their actions cowardly and inexcusable. Section 2, Evangelism and Emancipation, emphasizes how churches were venues where fugitive slaves were assisted, slavery itself was denounced, and blacks could organize to defend their rights. Clergy led, supported, and facilitated these functions. Preachers also acted as guardians of black religious practices and traditions. Whites, many affiliated with the Methodist Episcopal Church, interpreted their efforts to organize and develop black churches as racial insurgency, deserving of stiff opposition and hostility. Some from the first generation of AME ministers include David Smith, born into slavery in Maryland, and a one-time Amy Zion pastor, Dandridge F. Davis, who determined to seek out the Amy church after having a dream 
about a denomination of, quote, colored soldiers, officers, and all the sable sons of Africa, end quote. Richard Robinson, who connected to the AME mission in Haiti and ministered to a congregation in Port-au-Prince, William Cotto from Charleston, South Carolina, an activist preacher and member of the Maryland Colonization Society, and finally, Stephen Smith, who supported the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. Now, Daniel Payne wanted an Orthodox Christian denomination, an educated clergy, and an established dogma. His pursuit for an educated clergy led to a purchase of Wilberforce University in 1863. Serving as chairman of the Committee on Education, he proposed the ministerial course of study. Another educational advancement of this time was in 1837 when Amy's in Ohio formed Union Seminary near Columbus. In 1856, Payne established the Amy Church motto, God our Father, Christ our Redeemer, Man our Brother. Noticeably absent is the third head of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Payne felt its inclusion would provide license for unorthodox worship and beliefs. Women contested men for the right to preach. Jerina Lee especially persuaded men to support women's official inclusion. At the 1848 General Conference, delegates authorized annual conferences and pastors and their local churches and circuits to license women to preach, but it was met with vigorous protests. Payne especially vehemently opposed the action, saying that it would break up the sacred relations which women bear to their husbands and children, neglecting their household duties as itinerant preachers. Escaping slavery and immigration says that while expansion was a goal, it became a difficult objective to attain. The church struggled establishing a presence in Haiti. Focus shifted to westward and Canadian expansion. Denominational growth was inextricably tied to freedom issues that constantly confronted both slave and non-slave African Americans. Amy churches were under assault because they provided venues to oppose anti-black activities. Migrant blacks depended on Amy churches to receive them into the new communities that they reconstituted in various areas of the United States and Canada. Itinerant clergy spearheaded AME growth in such virgin locales. In addition, churches such as Allen Temple in Cincinnati served as stations on the Underground Railroad. Some congregations defended escaped slaves against slave hunters and clergy routinely preached to runaways. William P. Quinn and Thomas M. D. Ward, both future bishops, were pivotal for AAB growth in the West, mainly California, and the Midwest, mainly Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Kentucky. The establishment of churches in St. Louis and Louisville became linchpins for AME expansion into slave states and slave territories. Concerning AME membership, accounting for slave members and their whereabouts was a problem, for they could be sold or be runaways. Nevertheless, pastors were advised to keep slaves on their roster. The AME Zion Church was similar to the AME Church in that the clergy were involved in abolitionism, the Underground Railroad, and educational initiatives. However, the AME Church and the AME Zion Church differed in that the Zion departure from white ecclesiastical domination was less acrimonious and lacked a narrative like that of the AMEs. Secondly, the geographical spread of the AME church exceeded the AME Zion church, and AME expansion benefited from the evangelism and supervision of bishops, while the AME Zion church repudiated the lifetime Episcopal office. In itinerant ministers and a mobile lady, 
The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 spurred AME growth and required the denomination to protect runaway blacks. For example, Pittsburgh's Wiley Avenue congregation hosted a meeting of local blacks to approve resolutions to thwart slave catchers coming into the city. The bill caused a rush to Canada and Amy settlements established, especially in places such as Dresden, Ontario. Blacks fled westward to the Great Plains and Canada after the Dred Scott decision and bleeding Kansas. The Amy Church expressed strong admiration for Britain and her territory because of her emancipation of slaves in the West Indies and her suppression of the slave trade in Africa. At the 1856 General Conference, the Canada Annual Conference became the British Methodist Episcopal Church. Bishop Nazary would serve both as AME Bishop while at the same time presiding over the BME Church. The American Colonization Society was founded in 1816. It stressed immigration to Africa, mainly Liberia. Slaveholders rearticulated the aims of the ACS by stressing the removal of free blacks and leaving slavery intact. Richard Allen initially supported the ACS, but flipped due to the intentions of slave owners. AMEs were hostile to the ACS, but not to immigration. J.J.G. Bias encouraged immigration not only to Africa, but to Central America, South America, and to Haiti. Finally, and onward into the South and into the Caribbean, AMEs pledged to evangelize to North and South America, Africa, Asia, and the Isles of the Sea. AME sent missions to Central America, Jamaica, and Haiti. Even though life for blacks was harsh in the South, AME still were determined to expand there. Proof is in the establishment of the Louisiana Annual Conference at the 1860 General Conference. This concludes the Chapter 2 summary. Please stay tuned as Dr. Christina Dickerson Cousin interviews another dynamic panel on Chapter 2. Please submit your questions and comments via Facebook Live. Thank you again for joining us.